So, <clears throat> very good. So this is a talk on oscillating bases, which is a um, uh, truly obscure topic, subtopic in an obscure topic. Um, <laughs> so um, I used to always talk about additive bases. So you take a set of integers and you look at every number that can be written as a sum of H of them, and that's called the H-fold sum, and it's denoted um, HA. Uh, and we say that a set A, so sets, all of my sets are infinite sets of non-negative integers. And we say that a set A is an asymptotic basis of order H if uh, every number with the most finitely many exceptions uh, can be written as a sum of uh, H elements of the set A. Uh, and of course, you might have, I mean, every number is a sum of 10 squares. Uh, so the squares form a basis of order 10, uh, but every number is also a sum of four squares. And uh, so the squares form a basis of order four, but it's not the case that uh, every large number is a sum of three squares. So we say the exact order of a basis is the smallest integer h, if it exists, um, such that your set is an asymptotic basis of order h. So for the squares, the exact order is four. For the cubes, uh, it's an embarrassing unsolved problem uh, to know its exact order. All we know is that it's four, five, six, or seven. So, uh, if someone can actually determine what it is in the course of the talk, um, everyone will be very thankful and impressed. Um, yeah, and popularly conjectured to be four. Right. So there's a famous old, old theorem of Davenport that uh, the set of sums of four cubes contains uh, all but at most a set of density zero. So almost every integer uh, is a positive integer is a sum of four cubes, um, but the exceptional set is is known is not known, and there is a um, uh, sort of a large literature trying make giving bounds for the size of the exceptional set. But yeah, um, the, I mean there is again there's a very specific conjecture. There's a number which is conjectured to be the largest number that is not the sum of four cubes, some specific number. Yes. Um, again, you know, uh, we have an hour, just if you can do that, figure it out or be great. But yeah, I mean, it's just, a, it's, it's one of the classic open problems in additive number theory. And, uh, uh, the, which is intensively studied usually by the, uh, hardly little Vinogradov circle method, but, uh, and there's a lot of analytic work. Oh. Uh, one doesn't generally, uh, or there's been almost no study of uh, a slightly uh, weaker uh, notion of uh, 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 additive basis. You could say that a set is a density lambda basis of order H if the H fold sum set um, uh, is not necessarily all large integers. Uh, but even let's just say has uh, uh, a lower asymptotic density, his density at least lambda. And in particular, a density one basis would be a, a, a set A such that HA contains almost all integers that all, all accept a set of density zero. So the Davenport theorem says that the cubes form a density one basis, but uh, there's not uh, a lot of uh, investigation of these density type bases. What I'm interested in is this notion of a minimal asymptotic basis. So <clears throat> this is sort of an extremal uh, property of a basis. Suppose you have an asymptotic basis of order H, but it's very tight in the sense that if you take away any element from the set, it no longer is an asymptotic basis. Um, it doesn't mean that you don't, you, you don't change the sum set, it means that you can remove an element and maybe there are a thousand numbers no longer representable as an H-fold sum of terms in the sequence, but that still is an asymptotic basis. So if you had, so a minimal asymptotic basis of order H would have the following property. Somehow 
if you remove any element whatsoever from the set, you lose the representations of infinitely many different numbers. Um, so uh, it's not obvious that these uh, exist. Uh, they were introduced uh, uh, by Alfred Storr and independently by me a long time ago. Um, uh, one summer when I was sitting in the Weizmann Institute and trying to prove some conjecture of Erdős and Tehran, but um, uh, for, for bases of order one, there's nothing to say. An asymptotic basis of order one just means your set is cofinite. It contains all but finitely many integers. And of course, there can't be a minimal asymptotic basis of order one, because if you delete any element, you lose at most one element from this one fold sum set, so you still are representing all but finally many numbers. Um, oops, so let's see. Um, so, do there exist minimal asymptotic bases of order H? The answer is yes. And um, um, there's a whole German school of, of number theorists who studied these questions, and a man named Hertha uh, proved the existence of minimal asymptotic bases by uh, a, a kind of diagonal argument. It was a non-constructive argument. And uh, uh, and I constructed the first explicit examples a long time ago. So, so these minimal asymptotic bases exist. So then a natural question would be, if you have an asymptotic basis of order H uh, at least two, um, can you throw away elements and reduce it to a minimal asymptotic basis? Um, and the answer is is no, um, that's not possible. So minimal asymptotic bases exist, but not every additive basis contains a minimal basis. And uh, a very nice result is due to uh, Erdős and me from, again, from a long time ago. We constructed a, a set A of non-negative integers, which was an asymptotic basis of order two, and it had the following property. If you take any subset S of the set and you delete it, the what's left, A minus S, A with S removed, is an asymptotic basis if and only if you threw away just a finite set. And um, uh, they teach you in preschool that there's no maximal finite subset of an infinite set. So, you, so this set can't contain a minimal basis, right? It's, you can throw away a finite set, it's still minimal, but throw away anything else, you've still thrown away only finitely many elements of the set. So it still is a base, sorry, it still is a basis, uh, but you can't throw away an infinite set. So a basis with this property would have the property that it does not contain a minimal asymptotic basis. Um, actually, we did this only for bases of order two. And uh, it's a problem whether, problem in this talk doesn't mean it's an open problem. It just means it's a problem and it may have been solved. But it hasn't been solved to know whether you can construct a basis with this property uh, for bases of order uh, uh, greater than two. Um, uh, uh, another question is the following. Uh, this is a little bit more uh, subtle in a sense. Uh, Suppose you have a minimal asymptotic basis of order A, um, uh, sorry, of order H, exact order H. Uh -huh. So if you throw, throw away an element, it no longer is an asymptotic basis of order H, but it could be an asymptotic basis of higher order. And uh, so one, this really is an open problem. Can you construct a minimal asymptotic basis A such that whenever you delete an element, while it's no longer a basis of order H, it is a basis of order some H prime of A of higher order, where the order might depend on the element A. And, uh, and related uh, would be the problem if you have like two integers, like two and three, can you find a minimal asymptotic basis of order two, such that when you delete an element, any element, what's left becomes an asymptotic basis of order three. I mean, that's a curious question. This is actually related to um, uh, an old question of uh, Erdős and me that was recently uh, solved. It was, um, 
can you have a Sidon set of order two that is a set where um, uh, every number of uh, that's in the some set A plus A has a unique representation. Can you have a Sidon set which is a basis of order three? And um, uh, this was this, and the answer is yes. And this was recently done uh, uh, by some people in Cambridge or Oxford. Some people anyway. Um, okay. Yeah. Now, um, related to this note, so this notion of minimal basis is very nice. It's you have a basis, and no matter what element you delete from it, you destroy the basis property. Um, so you might ask uh, then uh, uh, another kind of question. Suppose you pick your favorite integer r, like 3. Uh, can you find or can you construct a basis? Let's make it a basis, just say basis of order 2. A basis of order 2, such that if you delete any element at all, it still is a basis of order 2. But if you delete two elements, it's no longer a basis of order two, right? So more generally, the question is, uh, for any number r, can you find a basis of order two such that if you delete any r elements, it no longer is a basis. But if you delete any r minus one elements, it, it remains a basis. So that's what one would call an r minimal basis. And uh, uh, an Aleph not minimal basis would be a basis uh, from which you can delete any finite set and it still is a basis, but not a um, not an infinite set. And um, and there do exist such bases. Uh, as I said a moment ago, that's this old theorem with Erdős, but only for bases of order two. Uh, it's not known whether one could construct an additive basis. Uh, uh, of order three or greater, from which you could remove any finite set, but no infinite set. Um, so in this, this is kind of like, um, um, there's something called the Court de Vague de Vries equation in the PDE. And, uh, there are all sorts of beautiful results about it, very strange results. And um, and Gelfand was talking about this one day, and he said something like this. He said, um, it's like you're looking at uh, this fantastically intricate spider's web, and you find this beautiful pattern in the spider's web, and then you find this other beautiful pattern in the spider's web, and you study these patterns, and the, or you study that pattern, he said, but but what you really should be doing is studying the spider, right? And so that's kind of my feeling about this. That is, there are all sorts of interesting phenomena about these additive bases um, that I'm talking about, but they're like different bits of the spider's web. And I have no idea what the, um, uh, the spider creating all this uh, is all about. Um, anyway, um, um, here's another theorem in the same spirit. There does not exist an asymptotic basis A of order two, such that for every subset U of A, the set A minus U is an asymptotic basis if and only if the set U that you're throwing away has density zero. So, so this is a kind of infinite analog of a minimal basis. Uh, so you have some set, which obviously has to be of, uh, to be interesting, positive density. And can there be such a set from which you can delete any set of density zero, um, but no set of uh, positive density? Uh, and uh, a partial answer to that is, uh, well, an answer is this, uh, such a thing can exist. Um, Okay. All right. Now, then there's the dual notion. So we say that a set is an asymptotic basis of order H if the H-fold sum set 
contains all large integers, all but final he many integers. So um, if you wanted to give a name to a set that was not an asymptotic basis of order H, uh, without uh, stretching your imagination too much, you might call it an asymptotic non-basis of order H. Uh, so an asymptotic non-basis of order H is just a set which is not an asymptotic basis of order H. And analogous to this notion of maximality for minimal for bases, you can talk of minimality for basis is the notion of maximality for non-bases. So you could say that an asymptotic non-basis is maximal if you add any number to it whatsoever and it turns from a non-basis to a basis. And uh, the first question is, do these things exist? And the answer is uh, yes, because there's a trivial example. Uh, if you take the even integers, this is not a basis of order two or of any order, because when you have an e add even integers, you get even integers, so you'll never get an odd integer in the sum set. But if you take any number that's not in the set, it's odd. And if you take the even numbers plus an odd number, the sum set does contain uh, every number from some point on. So, and there are other examples of maximal asymptotic non-bases that can be constructed uh, as the unions of non-negative parts of uh, suitably chosen uh, congruence classes. Um, and one can ask, do there exist mass maximal asymptotic non-bases that are not in this uh, 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 class that are that are not unions of non-negative parts of congruence classes? Um, and Erdős and I proved the following theorem. I mean, the answer to that is yes. Uh, and there's a kind of construction, uh, not exact. Well, it's kind of construction. Uh, that enables this. So, but it's very explicit. So you take uh, a sequence of positive integers that's um, increasing um, not too fast, right? So if you have the term n sub t, uh, n sub t plus one, like if h were four, n sub t plus one would be at least four n sub t plus four. And you look at uh, this set, this Square brackets, you know. Okay, so this the sequence is increasing not too slowly. It can be increasing very quickly. Yeah. Right, but but it can but it, right, it could be it, it can increase very fast, but uh, the slowest possible rate of increase is linear. It's 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 pretty slow. I mean, this is this is not fast. Um, uh, it's yes. Um, but so this is a lower bound for the rate of increase. It's not like super exponential or anything. But then you look at this union of intervals of integers. So square brackets around a pair of numbers means the, not the closed interval, but the closed interval of integers, all integers in between from the lower uh, limit to the upper limit. So I have this union of intervals. And uh, the theorem says that um, this set A, see, um, notice, if you if you add this set to itself h times, um, like here you have the number n sub t plus one. If you take if you take h fold sums of numbers up to n sub t plus one, you'll get at most h times n sub t plus one. The next larger number in this set would be h n sub t plus one plus two. So every number of the form h n sub t plus one is not in the sum set. So this is a non-basis. There are infinitely many numbers that are not in this set. Uh, but as it turns out, it does. this can be embedded in a maximal asymptotic non-basis. In fact, <clears throat> in a maximal asymptotic non-basis where you don't change the sum set at all, um, which is kind of curious. And it followed, but, <clears throat> but these intervals, get longer and longer and longer. So you have this maximal asymptotic non-basis that contains arbitrarily long intervals. So in particular, this maximal asymptotic non-basis is not the finite union of the non-negative parts of congruence classes. Uh, of course, there would have to be um, uh, gaps uh, if this were the case.
Now, this so why don't you introduce this notion of a maximal asymptotic non-basis? The first two questions you ask are, do they exist? And the answer is yes, and that's what we just proved. Uh, and then the second question is, if you have a non-basis, can it be a subset of a maximal non-basis? And for a long time, um, this wasn't known. And then a very clever guy named Julian Hennefeld, um, uh, heard me talk about this and very quickly, because he was a functional analyst who was used to thinking about things of this sort in a certain way, uh, proved the following. Uh, there exists asymp asymptotic non-bases of order H with the following property. Um, for every set V of integers, non-negative integers not contained in A, A union V, so you take this non-basis A and you add V to it. And this is an asymptotic non-basis of order H if and only if A union V is co-infinite in N0, that is the complement of of A union V is infinite. And um, because there is no maximal, co so just the way there's no maximal finite subset of an infinite set, uh, there's no, um, I, I should say, there's no, um, well, all right, maximal co-infinite subset of, of the integers. So there exists asymptotic non-bases of order H that are not contained in maximal non-bases. So, is there any sort of is there any sort of duality here? Like you can, I mean, this looks like it's a it mirrors the theorem we had earlier, right? Correct. So, so can you can you prove some sort of general duality between asymptotic uh, non basis and asymptotic uh, bases? So the answer is, um, I can't, but I don't know that it cannot be done. Right. I mean, uh, I once wrote a paper on unsolved problems, and I started off by giving an, a, the definition of unsolved problem. And I said, an unsolved problem is a problem that I can't solve. It doesn't mean that it hasn't been solved or that no one else can solve it. It just means, as I'm writing this paper, I can't solve the problem. So, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, Put it this way, do you have any theorem that you're pretty sure doesn't have a sort of symmet symmetric analog in the other direction? Um, sitting here right now at this time and place, the answer is no. Um, but the answer really is I don't know. Uh, and uh, yeah. But there are connections, as I'll point out in a little bit, between bases and non bases uh, that are kind of that are interesting. But it again, is, it's I like don't... as as you know, Gelfon was saying about the spider's web, these are like patterns in the web and somehow I'm missing the spider. So, you still haven't told us about the oscillations, by the way. Oh, I'll, I'll get to that. Um, life is short, but uh, I have 30 minutes left. Um, let's see, what does this say? Um, oh, so just the way I define, so this is in your duality spirit, just the way I define an R minimal basis, that is, it's a basis if you delete less than R elements, but not a basis if you delete R elements. I can talk about an S maximal basis. So an S maximal basis is a basis, X, S maximal non basis. In an S maximal non basis, if you add less than S elements, um, uh, Yeah, I, I, I say this, this is, if you add less than S elements, it still is a non-basis, but if you add S or more elements, it does, it becomes a basis. So this should be a greater than or equal to sign. So that S be a positive integer and a Y is subset of the complement of A. And non-basis of order H 
is S maximal if A union Y is an asymptotic basis of order H, if and only if Y is greater, I should have said Y greater than or equal to S. So that just, so, um, so maximal is one maximal. Uh, two maximal means it's not a basis at any number whatsoever, it's still not a basis, but add two numbers and it becomes a basis. Okay. And let's see. Do these exist? This is an interval. Ah, oh, okay. So there's a paper that Erich and I wrote uh, infinitely long ago um, where we answer some of these questions in a very explicit way. And the most interesting part of the paper is a construction in this lemma. So um, and this is the construction. So you take a set of positive integers, which grows um, sort of exponentially like this. Again, lower, it can grow faster if you like, but uh, so the kth terms at least five times the previous term plus three. And I let, so this is just for uh, bases of order two. So I look at the set of odd numbers, two QK plus one. And I construct the following set A to the AQ. So it's the interval of integers from 2QK. I mean, this is what it is exactly. 2QK minus 1 plus 2 up to QK minus QK minus 1 and QK plus 1 up to QK plus Q sub K minus 1. So I should have sort of drawn a picture of this, what this means. So you think of QK as being much, much bigger than QK minus 1. And what is involved in the interval of integers from QK minus one up to QK? So QK minus one is very small compared to QK. So this first interval is almost like all the numbers from zero up to QK, except some little bit at the beginning and some little bit at the end is missing. But then I add a tiny bit of numbers bigger than QK it's sort of like as near as what's missing between this upper bound and QK. So this is almost everything up to QK. And this is sort of like the tiny bit almost of what's missing, but you shift it over. So this is this set of integers. And I look at the sums of this set with itself. And um, notice if I if I wanted to write the number, 2qk plus 1 as the sum of two terms of this sequence. The larger sum n would have to be at least qk plus 1, right? If, if both terms were at most qk, the sum would be at most qk. But if the sum is 2k, 2qk plus 1, one number has to be bigger than qk. And bigger than qk and less than uh, 2q, less than 2q. Uh, means it has to be in this little interval. But then 2QK plus 1 minus a number in this interval ends up in this tiny little bit of numbers that are missing uh, below QK over here. So this number 2QK plus 1 cannot be a sum of two elements of this set. So this sum set is contained in the integers or the non-negative integers. I left out the subscript, n naught minus Q. Right? but it's a cofinite subset of this. So one can show in fact that only finally many numbers not in Q are not in the sum set, right? That is uh, that. Uh, but this set uh, AQ has a, uh, is very stable. If I add any finite set of numbers to this set and look at the sum set, uh, it differs from uh, uh, AQ only by, by finally many numbers. That is, I pick up only finally many numbers that uh, aren't in here. And if I throw away finally many numbers, I, I lose only finally. That is, this sum set, if I add or, if I add or delete any finite set, um, I only lose or 
acquire finally many numbers. That is, oh, is there a two missing in that in in the line? Differ from should be two aq. Yes. Okay. Right. Yes. Yes. Um, yeah. So this is a very stable set. All right. This is um, and uh, but it's but it has um, yeah. Um, with this, you can make a do a lot of constructions, uh, and here are some results. So forget the proof. Because, so first of all, uh, I defined an R minimal asymptotic basis that it's a set from which you can delete any R minus one elements and still as a basis, but delete R elements and it's no longer a basis. Um, so I can use this set to construct something like this. Uh, um, I can prove that every set of this form is contained in uh, not just an R minimal basis, but an Olive not minimal basis. That means uh, I can construct, I can use this set AQ to construct a set with the property that I delete any finite set and it is still an asymptotic basis. But if I delete any infinite set, it no longer is an asymptotic basis. Um, I can use this set AQ to construct an S maximal asymptotic non basis, that is, a non basis to which I can add any S minus one elements without. Here, here S is what? S is anything you want? Yes, fix S. Okay. All right. Uh, 17. So I can construct a set where I can add any 16 numbers and it still is a non basis, but I add any 17 numbers and it's no longer, and it becomes a basis. Um, um, now, <clears throat> there's another theorem which is, that we prove that says the following. Um, this is how I wrote my first paper with Erdős. Uh, I had written a paper on this subject, and. Um, uh, I put some open problems at the end. And uh, one was a question of, uh, of the, if you have, suppose you have uh, uh, an asymptotic non-basis of order two, um, and you can add any finite set, and it still is uh, a non-basis of order two. Um, uh, Is it contained in a maximal non-basis of order two? Um, so you can add any finite set and it stays a basis. Um, it stays a non-basis. So can it be contained in a maximal non-basis? And Erd and I sent a preprint to Erdős, whom I had never met. I sent it to him in Hungary, and somehow he got the paper fairly quickly, and he sent me a letter where um, he claimed to have proven something. Um, that if you can add any finite set and it still is a non-basis, then it can't possibly be contained in a maximal non-basis. And I couldn't understand this proof. And the more I tried to figure out the argument, I mean, the better I understood the argument. And finally, I understood that what uh, we could prove, that what he proved wasn't correct. And in fact, exactly the opposite was correct. So, um, uh, so the result is that if you can add any finite set to a non-basis and it still is a non-basis, then in fact, there's an infinite set you can add that turns it into a maximal non-basis. Uh, that was the result. And, uh, um, and what this implies is, so this is a break in the duality. There does not exist an olive not maximal asymptotic non basis of order two. So, an olive not maximal asymptotic non basis uh, would be a set where you can add any finite number of elements and it still is a non basis. Um, uh, but if you add any infinite no number of elements, it no longer is a non basis. 
Uh, and in fact, what we proved in the previous result is if you can add any finite set, then in fact, there does exist uh, an infinite set that can be added that turns it into a maximal non-basis. So the simplest, you know, sort of back and forth between basic and non-basis theorems uh, doesn't hold. I mean, this would be a, an instance of that. Okay. All right. I, I call this ridiculous oscillations. Okay. So now we're going from the uh, absurd to the more absurd. Um, that's because you can invent a name for anything, right? Uh, so let's say an asymptotic basis of order H uh, is an RS minimal maximal basis. What that means is you have an asymptotic basis of order H, but it's R minimal. So you can delete R minus one elements and still as a basis, but you delete any R elements and it becomes a non-basis. But, okay, but suppose you do that, you delete any R elements and it's a non-basis, but it's not just any R basis, any, uh, 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 no, I didn't write down this completely, I'm sorry. So uh, I, I didn't write down the whole definition. So this RS minimal maximal non-basis means you have a basis. If you throw away any R elements, it becomes a non-basis. You can add elements up to uh, S minus one of them, and it still is a non-basis. But if you add any S elements, it becomes uh, uh, a basis. I'm not following. Are we talking about a basis or a... what? What, okay. what happened here? Okay, so- Basis or non-basis, sorry. Wait, hang on a second. I have a simple solution to this problem, uh, I believe. Just one second. Um, using the miracle of... Uh, ay, 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 ay. Um, yeah, just one second. Okay. Uh, yes, yes. So an asymptotic basis of order H, I'm just going to write it down for one comma one, uh, is a minimal asymptotic basis, R1, blah, 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 if uh, A is a minimal asymptotic basis of order H um, and A is a uh, Let me try this. Okay. So an asymptotic basis of A of, of order H is a one one minimal max. So it's, it's a long word, but it's too stupid. Of order H. First of all, it's a minimal asymptotic basis. So, so if you take away any, any element A, it becomes a non basis. But it's just but it's not just a non-basis, it's a maximal non-basis um, for all A in A. So I have for all A, excuse me. So it means you take out any one element and it and becomes no longer average. a basis. And then you add any other or any element, any extra element, and it becomes a basis. Correct. This sounds sort of Matroid like with the replacement axiom. Well, it is a, a kind of, well, okay. 
So, um, so that's uh, the case R at S equals one. So, um, and let me put in then what is the an asymptotic basis of order H is an R S minimum basis of order H is A and then an asymptotic basis of order H. Let me see if this makes sense. Oops, has to compile first. Um, okay. So an asymptotic basis of order H is an, uh, oops. Uh, yeah, okay. Is an RS minimal maximal asymptotic basis if, First of all, A is R minimal. So you delete any R elements, it becomes a non-basis. Um, uh, but an A minus X uh, is an S maximal non-basis. We're all X So let's see if this makes sense now. So A is an R minimal basis. So if I take away any R elements, so take a subset X of A with R elements and delete it, you get a non-basis. But in fact, it becomes an S maximal non-basis. So I can then add any number of elements less than S and it still is a non-basis. But if, if I add S elements, it becomes a basis again. Okay, so that's my so that's a simple one sort of step oscillation. I can take away some stuff and it becomes a non basis, and then I can add stuff and it and it oscillates back to being a basis. Okay, Does that makes sense, Moshe. Hope so. Okay. Um, what about in the opposite order? So we can say that a non basis is an SR maximal minimal non basis, blah, blah, blah. If so, it's an S maximal asymptotic non basis. So you can, um, you take the set A and you can add any set of elements with not in A to A any set of S elements, and um, it becomes uh, a basis. Uh, so if A is an S maximal, asymptotic, non, S, uh, S maximal asymptotic non-basis of order H, and A union Y is not just an asymptotic basis, but uh, A union Y is an... Um, our minimal asymptotic basis of order H uh, for every subset. And again, that uh, little lemma construction I mentioned earlier uh, can be used uh, to get the following result that every one of those sets AQ is in fact contained in an SR max min asymptotic non-basis. Right? Um, so you can find this, again, with S and R equal to one, you can find a non-basis with the property that if you add any single element, it becomes a basis and delete any element and it becomes a non-basis again. Um, okay, let me add just one final statement. Um, this is kind of continues. So this is... Um, 
let me call this infinite oscillations. So this is one of my favorite incomprehensible theorems. It says the following. Um, there exists a set A, in fact, an asymptotic basis of order two, such that um, first Black Let's see if I can do this sort of like real time. So there's an asymptotic basis A of order two such that, um, let me make this better. So if I take, if I delete any element from A, um, this is a non-basis. And if I delete any element from A1, so if I let A2 be A minus A1, is a basis. Let's see how this compiles. So I take A, if I delete any element from A, I get a non-basis, A1. If I delete any element from A1, I get a basis A2. And If I delete um, any element, sorry, um, let me just say this properly. So if I take, if I delete an element from A, I get a non-basis, uh, A1. Uh, if I add any element to A1, um, so ignore all this. So here's the first two lines. I have a basis A of order two. Delete an element, I get a non-basis, A1. Add an element to A1, I get a basis. Delete an element from A2, I get uh, a non-basis. Uh, add an element
Oh. Sorry to interrupt, Mel. Yeah. Uh, but so as a, how concrete are these examples, right? So when we're talking about like a, uh, a minimal basis of order three, asymptotic, uh, can you write down like what one is or the lexicographically first one or? Uh... Um, so s <laughs> the question is, um, um, maybe what does one mean by a construction? Um, give me a second. So in that lemma, I construct a certain set as a set as a union of intervals. Right. Mm -hmm. Depending on a sequence uh, of these cues. So that's explicit in some sense. Then uh, I start adding elements to build up my, my minimal basis. So mm -hmm. I um so from some finite set I can pick an element, any element in some finite set, and I can add it. Um then uh, from that, from another finite set, I can pick another element. So I have a kind of algorithmic construction that would enable you to construct term by term the sequence until the sun burns out and there's no more uh, uh, solar system, right? But it's not that I can give you the nth term by a formula. It's mm -hmm. just, it's an algorithm to construct it term by term. So I don't know what that counts as. Um, uh, you know, it's not like the nth term is n squared. Right? You know, I can bound it. I can just, you right. know, and I can tell you. So you can, it's a kind of inductive construction. And that is having constructed the uh, added k numbers, then there's a, a, a formula, not a formula. There's a way to construct the k plus first number. It's, you know, an element and from si for some finite set which satisfies a condition that you can prove has to be satisfied. So that's the nature of it. Um, so this is an infinitely oscillating result. This says you can find a basis A of order two, such that if you take delete any element, it's a non-basis. From that set, if you add any element not in A1, you get a set A2, which becomes a basis. From the set A2, if you delete any element, you get a non-basis, A4, A3. From the set A3, if you add any element, it becomes a basis again, and so on forever. Uh, okay. And and so on forever. But you can't tell me if five is in the set. Is that I can reading that? So of course, oh, no, I can. I can, you know, I can. If if you say, uh, will five be in the set? Well, I mean, I can construct the first hundred million elements, and you know, you look and you see if five is there. Once you've done, once you've constructed the initial an initial bit. The next number you add is bigger, but okay. you know, um, and if you want it, and there's a way to write one. I mean, it's like you have a finite set. You choose one element of that finite set that satisfies some condition. There will be more than one that satisfies that condition. Pick any one, and you know, and then use that, and then go on to the next iteration of this algorithm. Uh, so I have no idea what one would call this in, you know, computability, but it's, uh, 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 anyway, so this sure. infinite oscillations theorem. Now, this is um, uh, hard to prove. This is, um, um, but it is, It's not, it's a theorem that, uh, Erdős and I wrote a paper where we proved this theorem. And um, when we'd be talking about this, Erdős would use probabilistic arguments to show you could do something. 
And since I have a uh, uh, an emotional aversion to probability, um, I tried very hard to get rid of the probability successfully, got rid of the probability, depending on your point of view. Now, from one point of view, probability is just combinatorics. It's right, you know, it's like the pigeonhole principle used over and over again is what most of combinatorics probably reduces to. So uh, a pigeonhole principle is just saying in a finite set, if you want to prove that, that there's going to be something in it. Um, so that's the kind of argument that's used. And I wrote up the paper. So I wrote up the paper so the word probability does not appear. And um, um, uh, I wrote up all our papers. And um, uh, there's only one paper that contains probability. And it's, uh, other people tell me that the paper is correct, but uh, uh, I'm sort of agnostic on the subject. But um, uh, so, yeah, I mean, I, from my point of view, it's, 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 it's so it's, it's kind of constructed. I don't know. I mean, if you want to prove something exists, um, I mean, you can prove something exists by a diagonal argument. Is that constructive? Uh, well, I guess not. I don't know. I mean, in any case, this is beyond my philosophic depth. And uh, But this is a theorem. This is, um, uh, it's really interesting. And uh, it's one of those papers which I assume no one except uh, uh, possibly the referee read. Um, but, uh, and more than likely the referee didn't read it because it's too complicated and just said, well, you know, it's probably okay. And the result is interesting. So let's publish it. You know, there's one theory of refereeing that says, uh, it's not the referee's responsibility to check the correctness of a proof. The referee's responsibility is to say whether or not the results are interesting and whether the proof is correct. That's the author's responsibility. So, uh, so I I don't know if anyone ever read this paper, but um, uh, in fact, <laughs> and one of the reasons why I'm trying to force myself to uh, uh, give this book to Springer that I promised they would receive 10 years ago uh, is that I want to include a proof of this and add enough detail so that it's humanly comprehensible. Uh, um, you know, it's, yeah. Anyway, um, these are the oscillations. That's the uh, uh, that's the story of all this. So uh, um, let me just try and do one other thing. Um, not video. Um, I know how to oh, remove pin. That's what I want to do. Okay. Uh,